after all that crazy stuff I just did here, there is then, let's see, something above there. And what am I supposed to call that? That's not M3 anymore. No, not. <laughs> that's M, so I'll say that's M4, and I'm gonna call that one Whistle Voice. Welcome to the Singwell Karaoke Show. I'm Lenore, at your service. Today's topic is order in the chaos of chest and head voice. I called Justin Stoney, the master of voice studies on YouTube, with this question and he was generous enough to answer it for us. And we have the letter of the day and we probably have some singing because this is a singing show. Let's do this. singer and a voice teacher. Today I have the greatest guest. It's Justin Stoney from New York Vocal Coaching. If you search on YouTube, Vocal Warm Up is right up there at the top and warming up not just your voice, but your body, which I always recommend to do, and your spirit and mood. So you are all set for singing. Uh, Justin Stoney has been so thorough and so science-based in his teaching. I'm, I love it. I eat it up. All of it. I love it. So very recommending all of you to go and, and learn from New York Folk Coaching. They also have a series of how to make all sorts of vocal imitations. And they have, they have all kinds of cool stuff. But today, I talked to Justin Stoney about head voice versus chest voice versus all the vocal registrations, um, including vocal fry, whistle tone. What is the difference between them? how are they made and what the hell is going on because it's very confusing and one of the most frequent questions i get from students either coming for lessons or email me uh, or whatever is how do i sing in my chest or how do i sing in my head or how do i switch between the chest and head or how do i mix the chest and the head and then I wanted to write an article about it at one point uh, because I thought I knew some stuff about head and chest because I'm a voice teacher, I'm a singer, I can do that work. But it's not as simple because when you go online and you search for vocal registrations or you search for uh, head versus chest, the confusion is mind-blowing, it's blinding, indefinite. It's impossible to make it out. If you go just and an, go on a wild search, good luck. You're gonna be there for a couple of years. So I just asked the master, Justin Sony, to put some order in the chaos, and he laid it all out for us and demonstrated the different registrations for us, so we can tell the difference and hopefully we know what to do next. I give you Justin Stone. All right, so we have Justin Stoney here. Hi, Justin. Hello, thanks for having me. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I've been a fan for a while, um, and it's very nice of you to come uh, on my show. And I, you have a very generous heart teaching the whole world. You have this um, channel called Voice Lessons to the World, and that's exactly what it is. And I think that's really cool. Um, that you really like, you, you really listen to what people want to know about, and then you you give them that. That's basically um, that's <laughs> ideal, right? Yeah, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> that's the way to go. So people have been writing to you, like writing letters with questions to you, and then you would read them on on your YouTube channel and and answer them. That's a little bit what I'm doing on my show. I'm like having people calling me and asking questions. Yeah. Um, but today I will be the student asking the question and you will be Great. the teacher. So but beside having that YouTube channel, which is like 10 times bigger than mine, mm -hmm. um, uh, you have a whole school in New York. Um, hold on, it's called New York, New York Vocal Coaching, correct? Yeah. 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 And it's, yeah, it's a big thing like you have everything there you have speech therapy you have acting lessons and, and musicals and um speech pathology pathology i saw i've seen you have a lot of teachers there and one cat i believe 
<laughs> yes, yep, for sure. <laughs> Uh, and there's more than one but there's only one that we have on the site yeah yeah okay <laughs> that's good to know uh so whoever is allergic just you know just noting that it's not an actual cat it's They're just not in the lessons no <laughs> <laughs> um and then you also have um, a vocal course right you have like an yeah. online course and you have a course that you're teaching teachers yes and is that a live um, teaching program? That is a live teaching program. Um, we do uh, several semesters each year to work with voice teachers and empower their journey, both from the information standpoint and inspiration standpoint. Uh, but yeah, it's a live class uh, around the world uh, and also in New York City. Yeah. yeah oh that's awesome so um basically my dream <laughs> oh. to have a school but it also feels like a lot of responsibility I don't know if I want that part it's a lot I have yeah. to think about it <laughs> it's like a labor of love I suppose yeah. yeah 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 so um I think you are the right person then to, to ask this question uh I've been wanting to write an article about the vocal registrations chest hope voice head voice falsetto, mixed voice. Um, I get questions about it all the time. It's a subject that is very occupying yeah. um, to people. Uh, like it's on people's mind. I, I, from the way you're nodding, I suppose you, you get a lot of questions about that as well. All the time. It's probably the most asked about subject, if not the most, one of the most. Right. Why do you think that is? That was not my question, but I'm just curious. Why do you think it's so burning? I believe it's burning because to me, it's the number one request from voice students. Even if they didn't mean to request it, that's what they're asking for. Like if they're a beginner and they don't know what to call things, or if they're an advanced person and they do know what to call things, everybody wants smooth, even blended registers. Uh -huh. It's the number one request for making a singer sound the way they want to sound and so it's very important to get right so is it a control thing because it, in different styles you are very much allowed to switch registers and like not having it even right you can break you can yodel you can do all kinds of stuff sure but even the breaking and the yodeling of course is its own kind of control can there we you say go. right now i want to do that and another time i don't want to do that, that yes. that's a control in itself Yes, exactly. All right. So the question is, so there is this thing called head voice. There's this thing called chest voice. There is the mix. There are all kinds of re registrations, as you call them. And you hear a lot about those from different teachers. And everybody thinks something different about how they're made, uh, what they're called. I saw at some point somewhere that there are like 98 different terms for head and chest and all the mixes that just blew my mind. I thought there was going to be more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there is a lot of um, uh, mix up, pun intended, and uh, I would love for you to help me out and just put some order in the chaos. What are the registrations? How are they made? I think you're the only one that I found on YouTube that is referring to the vocal cord function yeah. uh, rather than where the voice is in the register in the mm. range yes. so could you talk about that and and, and save us i like. will try my best <laughs> uh the first thing that i'll preface all of it with is that it's okay that different schools and different methods and different people name things different names um and we want to be respectful of that and also be able to speak many different vocal languages with other teachers and with mm -hmm. other and with different students that we have that come from different backgrounds. For me, when I'm working with a student, I'm never interested in like making sure they have like the right term. Even when I work with a voice teacher, I'm not trying to make sure they have the right term. I just want to make sure they can communicate what they want from the singer right. as far as registration. In other words, I could call it that strong voice or that flexible voice. And as long as we know what we're saying, it doesn't even matter what the terms are. This being said, I will give you some terms that I hope make it very concrete. That would be great. Okay. 
percent. So the lowest uh, vocal register is vocal fry, which is below the chest voice, and that is what we might call an M zero register, mode zero, M zero. Mm -hmm. The M terms are some of the most scientifically up to date terms. So if you want to use those, M1, M2, M3 are very safe terms to use as opposed to chest voice and head voice, which are also mm. great and fun. Okay, but M0 would be your fry. So if you're at the lowest part of your voice, <coughs> yeah. Very good. Like yeah. that? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I'm not really good at that for some reason. Like it depends on the it depends on the day. Yes, so, it can. Um, why why is that? Um, it it can depend on sort of how swollen your vocal folds may be from different things. Uh, just waking up in the morning, hydration. Um, you know how you've used your voice and also how you've warmed up. But uh, ideally, um, we learn to find it very quickly. And one of the best ways to do it is just to find your lowest chest voice note. Let's see, do you have this mm -hmm. note right here? Ma, ma, ma. Ma, ma, ma. Good, how about this one? Ma, ma, ma. Good, how about this one? Ma, ma, ma. Whoa, yeah, low notes, wow. How about this one? <laughs> ma, ma, ma. Good, and I think right around here you're gonna uh, go from chest to <laughs> well, I heard it. How about with some glottals? Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. And a little glottal can encourage it because it's right on the fold level uh, 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 and it gets uh, that uh, uh, popping uh, uh, sound going. Yeah, right. And then I can put a, an actual note on it. Yeah. And some of those notes down in Fry can be nebulous. They can be sort of not quite as exact as mm -hmm. a chest or head, but I, you know, they, they can be there nonetheless. So that's M0 Fry and you can go all the way down there. And you can also use it as a stylistic effect, like an, I love you, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that's, so that's M0. M0, vocal fry. 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 Then we get into the next one, which is M1, which is known uh, classically as chest voice. Um, that's a very old term, chest mm -hmm. voice. And the cool thing is it doesn't really have to do with your chest at all. That's not what produces it in any kind of way, but we do feel some extra vibrations there, uh, which are conductive vibrations versus resonance. It's a different thing. So if you put your hand huh. on your chest and you say, ah, ah, I feel a little conductive vibration, right? What does that mean, conductive vibration? So maybe just my English is not my first language. So what does Understood. that mean? Understood. Well, there's conductive vibrations versus sympathetic resonance. And sympathetic resonance is the resonance that we know as vocalists, right? That's our, our main, uh, is what the audience hears. If right. the sound waves pinging and zinging around in our heads. Right. Uh, conductive vibrations would be surfaces or parts of your body nearby to the resonance that sort of vibrate uh, in, in a way that's not resonance, that's like the space has sound waves buzzing, but a vibration right. that is passed on. Like if I bang my piano like this, it vibrates. But if it was hollow, it would vibrate and also uh, resonate. The sound waves would be buzzing in, in through the hollow space. So this is not hollow space vibration. It's vibration that's conducted to solid surface. And so what I'm saying is that chest voice doesn't have to do with chest as far as its resonance. It has to do with it with something that you feel, okay? Right, so we feel the chest vibrations. We, we don't hear them on the outside. You said it. So right. resonance is what the audience hears. Mm -hmm. Conductive vibrations are what the singer feels. Cool, all okay? right. Okay, so that'll be M1. Mm -hmm. So chest voice is like most people's speaking voice. So if you just say, hello there. Hello there. Right, and then you sang a note like, hello there. Hello there. Very nice. That's your chest voice. 
Now, what's happening here is we're getting greater vocal fold depth and mass. The mm. vocal folds are vibrating on a thicker part of their, uh, of their mass. So we're getting literally more of the vocal folds participating. And yeah. I think you can really feel that when you, you compare the two sounds, like if you just say, hey. Hey. And then you say, hey. Hey. Yeah, you can kind of really feel like a lot, a little on the- Okay, mm, yeah, that's actually true. Yep. Yeah. So there's the, the something that not a lot of people know that the vocal folds, um, before you actually take a look at them, you might think that they're like two little slivers of, of skin sort of like touching each other, but they're more like two couple of stakes, right? Yes. Like they're stake pieces sort of like coming together. And so what you said about mess, I want people to visualize that just two, pe two pieces of steak just touching each other and like through the whole thickness. Yeah, totally. Or if we're going to use this steak analogy, which is fun, chest mm. voice would be like taking two steaks and slapping them together. Mm. Whereas head voice would be like taking just the side of the steak and mm. just barely touching the sides of the steaks together. So we're, we have more beef in chest Okay. Voice. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah and then is it true that with head voice that we're going to talk about soon i suppose um that by definition it will have more air coming through the vocal cords because they're like the closure is less thick i wouldn't say by definition actually and here's why breath can be controlled as an independent function so right. you could use like more breath in chest voice and less breath in head voice but what is true is the vocal folds will do a better job resisting it in chest. So mm -hmm. it'll hold it back better, but you could still have it not held back, but hold it back mm -hmm. with your body instead of with your vocal folds. Right. So there are a few components there. What the vocal cords do, what our breath control does, yep. and then we can manipulate the, the resonances as well, right? And that can yes. contribute to... I did a course once that really uh, showed us how confusing it is. Like someone can be in M1, mm -hmm. but it will sound almost like head voice. Yep. Uh, and they can be in, in M2, but it will sound like chest voice because there are other manipulations going on. Correct. And I do like to think of resonance as a separate component uh, from all of this. Sure, it influences the register, but it's ultimately a different subject than the register itself. The register right. itself is what is happening at the vocal fold level. And that's why we say, is it uh, one of these or uh, a thick mass? Or as we'll look at M2, head voice, a very thin mass is now uh, coming together. And it's a, it's a very, very subtle coming together, especially when you compare it to chest voice, which is very thick. Uh, okay. in its so that's M2, or we could say, head voice, also known as falsetto. All right. So that was, I was going to ask something about that because I come from a classical background and I have never heard a teacher mixing the two terms, head voice and falsetto. Mm -hmm. For them, it's like different. It's two different things. So you refer to those as, as the same thing. M2 is falsetto and head voice. I don't necessarily refer to them as the same thing. It depends on the person and the school, just as you have said. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. I would say historically, the most common thing to do is to call M2 for a male falsetto okay. and M2 for a female head voice. Gotcha. So that's where a lot of the confusion comes from right there is those are really equivalent registers but we have a different term historically for what we've used for males versus females. And historically, a male head voice is actually a kind of mix, which really throws it off uh, completely. But that is <laughs> where some of these you know, battles come from right there with what you just yeah, said. Yeah, that's fantastic. OK, so do you want to talk about that a bit? Well, sure. Let's talk about the male head voice. Yeah, so uh, uh, I could I could use some. Info yeah, so a, a male head voice is uh, 
something that's going to connect to the chest voice versus huh, disconnect, mm. okay? which actually in its nature makes it a kind of M1. See, we talked about M1 chest being a thick, thick beef. Is there, are there uh, kinds of thinner coordinations that still connect with M1? Absolutely there are. That's what we call a mix. So okay. I don't have to, for example, go up with my full chest voice all the time. I don't have to may, 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 may. I don't have to do that. But I also don't have to may, 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 switch to falsetto. I don't need to may, 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 may. I can find something that is still an M1, but you hear may. It doesn't have to be every bit of beef I've got, may, 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 I can find a little bit mm. of that chord thickness. So it's not, woo, separating into M2, but mm, may, 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 something that's still connected to my M1 chest. And that, even this voice, may, 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 head voice, male head voice, may, 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 goes right down to the bottom without any Huh. reverse yodel. So what you just did that descent, that was a demonstration of how you do M1 in a more, in a lighter way? Correct. A lighter right. M1, also known as male head voice historically. That's not my term. I'm just saying mm -hmm. male head voice. You could call it head dominant mix for a female or a male. You could call it mix. But the point of it is it's an M1 connected to M1, yeah. but it's not the thickest M1 that we can do. So what would be M2 then? May, switching to the next gear. Okay, yeah. And if I'm a, a male, historically, I'm going to call that falsetto. And if I'm a female, historically, I'm going to call that head voice. Okay, so that makes sense to me. Um, the, the falsetto, the, from the classical uh, background that I learned, um, they basically refer to that as when the guy sounds like a girl, if I have to be very, very simplistic. Of course. And uh, yeah. very historic about it. Yeah. So, yeah, so it doesn't necessarily have to, to mean that, but it's more about that quality, right? The quality of the voice, and that comes from the level of the vocal cords themselves. Yes, I, I hope that people mean the level of the vocal folds because that's what's accurate. When we start getting into the quality or the resonance or the tone, that's where it gets confusing because those things are variable. As you said, you had that course yes. where it was confusing when we entered another variable. But what it is at, the, at its core is that vibrational state. Thick vibration, a little less thick, a little less thick than that. That right. is the nature of a register. Yes. Even though other variables influence that register. Right. Um, I just want to use this um, opportunity to plug shamelessly, uh, plug in uh, one of your videos that talk about the registrations, Great. but I forgot what it was called. <laughs> well, we have but, a vocal registration world tour that I did once. I think okay. Was, yeah. So everybody go on mind. YouTube and check it out. I, I just think it's really helpful to hear all of those demonstrations and you just demonstrate basically the whole piano, which, <laughs> is, <laughs> yeah. um, which is entertaining and very impressive. So, okay. and, and it helps, it helps to hear it. You hear the different, the different vocal functions. Um, okay, but before we wrap it up, I just wanna, I wanna hear a little bit about the M3. Yes. Yeah. So there's M3 and I would theorize M4, which is just my own thing. I don't know that science has caught up to all the things that voice teachers are doing. And that's a good thing to just throw out there um, for an encouragement for all of us voice teachers. We have a little bit of a notion these days that science is so advanced. And if we as voice teachers don't know all the science, we're nothing. In truth, it's the reverse way around most of the time. Voice teachers are doing a lot of stuff that really works great and science hasn't caught up to it yet and mm -hmm. is still trying to do the research to figure out what voice teachers are doing. So if you're a voice teacher and you think, oh man, all this science, I must be no good. 
it's not really the case. Science still catching up to what teachers have been doing for hundreds or maybe thousands of years. So just throwing that out there. Yeah. But, but what I'm going to tell you why I think that there's M3, which is something that you will hear in scientific journals, and also an M4 uh, that we need to distinguish. So when you get up to the top of um, M2, so if you're you know using traditional language, female head voice or male falsetto, there's another register that's going to pop out of there, which we can call flagellet or M3. So if I'm going up in my falsetto, I got this going on. Now I can turn the corner and flagellet. It's okay. distinguishable from the M2 falsetto. And, and any female voice or male voice, but female voice in particular, because you're used to taking head voice up, 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 up. There's going to be a little place where it cracks into yet another thing beyond the head voice. So and, isn't that whistle? Well, now see, that's why I wanted <laughs> to bring up this point, because some people would call that whistle. All right. Other people would call it M3. Other people would call it, I would call it flagellate or flute voice. But here's what I'm saying. After all that crazy stuff I just did here, there is then, let's see, something above there. And what am I supposed to call that? That's not M3 anymore. No, not. That's M so I will say that's M4 and I'm going to call that one whistle voice and the one before uh, flagellate flute. So again, different schools, yeah. different people. It's all good by me. But you can, I hope, hear a distinction and I'll just explain a distinction between zero, one, two, three, four. So it sounds like the M4 is a lot more difficult to articulate on. Is yeah. it also more difficult to control the pitch on it? I don't know. Um, nope. Yeah, no. It's, it's controllable, yeah. Does everyone have whistle tone? They can, they can learn, yep. Everyone can learn. Yeah. Okay. Whether or not they should is a whole different discussion. <laughs> I, I, I do it and people think it's really cool. Um, I don't teach it very often unless somebody says, Justin, I'm desperate for it. Because mm -hmm. to me, our discussion about M1 and M2 and how they intersect and having lots of different options in those two registers and different mixes, that is where the vast majority of our singing lies, like 98%. And all this other stuff is just kind of like, I don't know, it's like a party trick. Yeah, it's yeah. totally a party trick, but people have made uh, careers on it, right? Uh, yeah. When they some, have mastered it. Some, some, yeah. But I would, encourage, it. I would encourage singers to try to make their career on the first stuff. Yes, because I've known some people who can whistle voice like crazy and it doesn't mean that they can sing a song well, if that right. makes sense. And you could never learn whistle in your entire life and be a world class singer. So that's just something. To Priorities. Yeah. Priorities. <laughs> Priorities. Yes. Yes. I think that's good advice. Um, I, I mean, we have to go, but do you have one more minute for one more question? We'll take one more. Sure. Okay, now I have to remember what it was. Um, yeah, it was something about the whistle um, and the career. No, I think I just forgot it. Oh, that's okay. No problem. Uh, well, we'll yeah. do, maybe we'll do this again. I'd be happy to come back if you'd like to have me back and we can- No, I would love to have you back for sure. Maybe, maybe do you... a deeper dive or do a different subject. I'm happy to do okay. it. Okay, I remember. <laughs> okay. okay. So, um, about that, uh, 
basically postponing teaching Wasseltown and prioritizing the M1 and M2. Does that have also something to do with the whistle tone being a bit more dangerous vocally, like that people are more likely to do wrong things? Some would say so. In my experience doing it and teaching it, I wouldn't think of it as a harmful thing. Um, people are very quick to say, oh no, it's gonna hurt you, it's gonna hurt you. I don't know that there's any research to support that, much more superstition um, and mm. like fear, like the, there's a lot of fear talk in the world of singing. There's a lot more of that than actual data to back up it being unhealthy. I've never had anybody hurt themselves or uh, report a problem from doing it. But that being said, it doesn't promote a lot of benefits either, like the rest of the voice does, because it's really a very um, glottal like, <laughs> glottal like ah, kind of coordination. And that is over time, not maybe the best focus. It's not wrong, it's not bad, but it's not maybe your priority as we said before. Right? Is it, is it um, only like the tips of the stakes touching there? Yeah, so it would be, it'd be the tips, but it'd be the tips being brought in firm contact. Like mm. a little bottle. Mm. And, then, and then leaking. <laughs> Through that, yeah. through that spot. Yep. yep right, yep. right, right, right. Yeah. I can do whistle when I wake up and I stretch. Then it comes Once out. again, because <laughs> of the swelling that we see in the morning, you know, yeah. the vocals are already sort of, uh, you know, grinding up and they have a stiffer kind of relationship. And that stiffness allows you to whistle right through there. Exactly. Right. Yes. So we could say that M0 and M4 actually have quite a lot in common with one another. That would be a, a truth. Full circle. I yeah, like that. Circle. Full yeah, circle. but it doesn't it doesn't benefit your instrument necessarily to work on those. It's more no, the M1 no. and M2. No, not in my experience teaching and like trying just about everything uh, under the sun. I don't find those techniques to be nearly as fruitful as the others. So they're fun. They're interesting, uh, worth trying, but don't spend uh, you know, the majority of your practice on that. That's what I would say. What would be the best way for someone, uh, a beginner, say, uh, to understanding the registrations, to go about learning how to use them? Where's well, the place to start? I think, you know, really making sure that you have a clear, clear chest voice so that you're finding a clear speaking voice and you're able to say, hello, how are you? Hey there three, two, one, and sing in those voices and really may, 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 having a clear sound so it's not breathy, may, may, may. It's, it's really nice and solid in the chest voice, nice and strong. And then taking the M2 up, you know, quite high without straining or pinching, but learning that we can stretch that and really build the top of the voice. And right. From there, there's a million ways to combine the two things. But yes. Establishing the strength and establishing the flexibility uh, yes. would be a great starting point. Yes. Mm -hmm. I would start with your with your exercises from that uh, world tour. What is it called? The registration world tour. Yeah, vocal registration. Because you have an exercise for each register, right? Ah, yes. Yeah. yeah and then just develop an awareness to what happens in your throat because wherever you are you just want to make sure that you're not doing that by pinching and straining yep so and if just... possible getting with a great instructor in your area uh lenore would be uh, a great one um in the but, netherlands yeah, uh, yeah or sure. online but 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 yeah online but um you know finding a teacher you know even if you can only do a lesson or two to really set you up on that good path yes always always recommended always absolutely wow justin uh this has been a blast for me i really liked it um i i was at the edge of my seat oh, good. the entire time um well, hopefully yeah i'll be happy to do it again if you'd ever like to have me but uh, this was really uh, a great uh, pleasure so thank you for having yes me. thank you and have a great day over there i'm gonna have a good night and uh i will for sure have you on again if you're willing because Great. we have a lot to talk about. I have yes, a lot to, we have yeah. a lot to learn. Yeah, yeah. sure. 
That's all, all, right. what it's all about. Just keep, we always got to keep learning all of us. So. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise we're, yeah, we're old, right? <laughs> There's that. Uh, yes. I, and I always learning, say, you get old. I always say the greatest teachers are just the greatest students. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. So. So Fantastic. Thank you so much. And we'll be in touch. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Bye bye. <sighs> was that something? That was a, a ride for me. <laughs> that was a lot uh, of information, but on the other hand, it was ordered. So I'm really glad that we did this call. And it was also very entertaining. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I really <laughs> enjoyed it. Um, and enjoyed listening to Justin doing all these um, different sounds. Uh, so let's recap, basically. Justin explained that there are modes in our vocal cords and those create the vocal registrations. And there are five modes, according to him. There's mode zero, mode one, mode two, mode three, and mode four. And I'm going to try and lay out what is each, and I hope I get this right. So let's go. Mode zero is the vocal fry. And mode one is the chest voice, which some people will call speaking voice or speech level singing. Uh, that's actually a whole approach. Some people will call it belting when you take that to the high notes, but that's when the vocal cords are closing in the full mass. That's mode one and that's the chest voice. Mode two is for males, historically speaking, don't kill me in the comments, for males will be falsetto, for females, M2 will be head voice. But if you're talking from the school that I came from, the classical singing, um, there is a tendency there to say indeed that when male are using what Justin described as M2, then that is actually a mix of chest and head. And that's actually my approach as a singing teacher when I teach classical music and opera specifically, is to mix um, head and chest, but also use um, the speaking voice in there. It's a whole thing. I'm still restless about this. And yes, I do realize that we did not discuss mix one thing at a time. Please, patience. Maybe Justin will agree to come on again and explain what is mix and how do you mix the registrations. Let's keep going. M3 would be what Justin calls flageolet. I admit I tend to confuse the flageolet with whistle because as you saw in the call, I asked him, isn't that just whistle? And he said like, yeah, some people will say it's whistle. It sounds like whistle because it's not a full voice. It's a lot less full than either chest or head. So, and it, it's also very high. So it sounds a little bit like a whistle, but then he calls it flageolet because he thinks that whistles is a different thing. In his voice, it's actually very clear because he has both so you can compare. But then he realized after you go up and up and up the flageolet, and you think that's a whistle, there is another, almost like a crack that happens and another door opens and you get a whole mode, which he calls mode four, which is probably the whistle. <laughs> but there you go. Four modes plus a zero mode, five in total. I hope that helps, but in my opinion, it doesn't have to occupy us as much as it does. Understanding the vocal registrations is fascinating stuff. I love it, uh, even though it makes me miserable. <laughs> but it's great. It doesn't really solve the really main issue that most singers have when they learn how to sing, which is how to get the voice to free up. Yeah, if you are style specific and you really need to nail that chest versus head, you will need to understand the difference between them and then control 
uh, the difference between them and then be able to switch and mix and do whatever the frick you want. But the, the main thing that you have to occupy yourself with is how do I enable my voice to do anything I want it to do? Start there, yeah? Free up your voice, then go ahead and geek about the vocal registrations. That's what I think. So without all of this mess, a little bit cleared up. Let's move on to the letter of the day. So for the letter of the day, I chose a question from Daisy. That's the name that I made up for her. And she asks, how can I choose a song that fits my voice? I chose this question for today because before you start handling the different qualities in your voice, chest, head, uh, you know, all of the things that Justin talked about, uh, fry, whistle, flageolet, whatever. First of all, what I'm going to say uh, is the most important guideline when you're finding a song that is good for your voice is that it feels good. And I say that also about practicing in general and about any, any kind of vocal technique training that you go through. The main indication that you're looking for is how does it feel in the throat because most people can tell if they're making an effort when they make a certain sound or not, yeah? So if you go to a high note, are you straining? Does it feel like you're squeezing? Does it actually feel like hard work? Does it feel like pain? Not just with high notes. In, just high notes is a good example because people tend to strain when they go to high notes. So if you do that, you will feel it. And if you feel it, that's a red flag. So if you take a song that is comfortable for you, you will feel that less. Yeah? And if you're just a strainer, like I used to be, <laughs> you're just making an effort in order to sing, no matter what, like I used to, then just go and play it safe. And that's how you do it. You pick an easy song, get a good song that you can actually sing. So I talk about that a lot um, with every new student that comes to me and sometimes I need to remind them along the way as well. You need to choose a song that is comfortable in your voice. And if you're starting out, and I don't know if Daisy's starting out or not, but if you are, then you should choose a relatively simple and easy song to sing. I have a video about that uh, with five ideas uh, of the easy songs that you can start with. And my idea of an easy song is a song that has a very short range. So maybe, you know, a fifth or a sixth, meaning five or six notes. Um, and that's something that you don't have to constantly think about while you're practicing oh, this is really hard and here comes the high note and here comes the long note and here I have to use a lot of power. But you use the simple song to develop your vocal skills. And that's what I would recommend everybody does in the beginning. Now, if you're singing a classical music, then the 24 and now it's 28 arias, Italian arias, are very legit to move around keys and you have different um, additions or different voice types uh, right there. And you should pick the key that is comfortable in your voice. If you're singing popular music, you can move around, you can move the key around. That's actually very possible. And here's how you do it. If you play um, a guitar, then you take the cape and you just move the cape around to change the key, easy peasy, yeah? If you play piano and you have an E piano, you have a function there that changes the key easy peasy. If not, if you play the piano, for example, or if you play the guitar, but you want to tone it like a step down and not up, then it's a little bit more complicated, but not so complicated. Actually, you have websites online that transpose the chords uh, of a certain song to a different key. So you copy paste the chords, which are very easy to find on Google for almost any song, if you're talking about popular music or what they call CCM, um, pop rock, uh, even jazz, you get the chords online quite easily, you paste them onto that uh, website, and then that, you know, you choose a different key and it changes the key for you and you can play and accompany yourself. Now here's what you do if you don't accompany yourself, so you don't play guitar or piano. 
So what you do instead is that you go and you look for a karaoke back track or a karaoke app. I've done a review of karaoke apps. I'm going to link to it, um, but I did find two of them, Magic Sing and Kara Fun, and those will change the key for you. Now, there is, of course, a catch because they want some payment at some point. So some of the songs are going to be behind the paywall. But of course, that's their right if they're give, giving you this really cool feature of changing the key. I think they deserve something in return. But if that doesn't work for any reason, you can still go on YouTube and look for a karaoke track in, um, in a different key. So you either choose you know, song name, karaoke, higher key, or song name, karaoke, lower key. And in many cases, you will find it because that's how awesome our internet is. That's how I would recommend you find a song that is good for you without knowing your voice. You start with something short ranged and then you go and you try different keys with the song and you see where it fits you. That's how I would do it. And thank you for the question. And now it's karaoke time. Ah! <laughs> Sorry. So it's karaoke time and I'm going to sing one of my favorite songs. What's up from Four Non Blondes. And I chose this song because it has a lot of chest and head voice in it and you can flip around and just mess, mess with it. That's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> so let's just do it. Five years and my life is still trying to get the gray bin feel of home for a destination. I realized quickly when I knew I should that the world was made of this brotherhood of men for whatever that means. And so I cry sometimes. Lying in bed just to get it all What's in my head and I I'm feeling very And so I wake up in the morning And I step outside And I take a deep breath And I get up And I scream at the top of my lungs What's going on? And I say
And so I wake up in the morning and I step outside and I take a deep breath and I get Just a nature.